Okay, I am up. Um, loud audio. Um, so, I've piloted this concept, this um, new series, a couple times now. Hasn't come out perfect, but I think I have the idea down and the technical stuff down. So I'm going to be doing a new series called Required Reading, where I actually listen to required reading for school. Um, it's going to come through um, via TTS, text-to-speech. I have some articles queued up that I need to read slash listen to. One of the main reasons why I'm doing this is because, at least as a first pass, um, I always do better listening and fidgeting with something, so Stardew Valley is what I'm going to be fidgeting with while I listen to my required reading. I might uh, pause to give some commentary on certain things here and there, but otherwise i um, just going to listen and play some Stardew. Uh, come hang out. Alright, let's go. The first... So... The required reading we'll be listening to today is uh, a few articles on recursion and theory of language slash grammar for my natural language processing class. The first article is called AI's Language Problem. I'll get it started right now. Let me do that. And we'll read it. Yeah, we'll do. I've been switching between US, UK, and Australia English. We'll start with uh, Amer uh, American, U.S. English, and here we go. AI's language problem. Machines that truly understand language would be incredibly useful, but we don't know how to build them. By Will Knight Archive page, August 9, 2016. About halfway through a particularly tense game of Go held in Seoul, South Korea, between Lee Seedal, one of the best players of all time, and AlphaGo, an artificial intelligence created by Google. The AI program made a mysterious move that demonstrated an unnerving edge over its human opponent. On move 37, AlphaGo chose to put a black stone in what seemed, at first, like a ridiculous position. It looked certain to give up substantial territory, a rookie mistake in a game that is all about controlling the space on the board. Two television commentators wondered if they had misread the move or if the machine had malfunctioned somehow. In fact, contrary to any conventional wisdom, move 37 would enable AlphaGo to build a formidable foundation in the center of the board. The Google program had effectively won the game using a move that no human would have come up with. About the art. One reason that understanding language is so difficult for computers and AI systems is that words often have meanings based on context and even the appearance of the letters and words. In the images that accompany this story, several artists demonstrate the use of a variety of visual clues to convey meanings far beyond the actual letters. AlphaGo's victory is particularly impressive because the ancient game of Go is often looked at as a test of intuitive intelligence. The rules are quite simple. Two players take turns putting black or white stones at the intersection of horizontal and vertical lines on a board, trying to surround their opponent's pieces and remove them from play. Playing well, however, is incredibly hard. Whereas chess players are able to look a few moves ahead, in Go this isn't possible without the game unfolding into intractable complexity, and there are no classic gambits. There is also no straightforward way to measure advantage, and it can be hard for even an expert player to explain precisely why he or she made a particular move. This makes it impossible to write a simple set of rules for an expert-level computer program to follow. AlphaGo wasn't told how to play Go at all. Instead, the program analyzed hundreds of thousands of games and played millions of matches against itself. Among several AI techniques, it used an increasingly popular method known as deep learning, which involves mathematical calculations inspired, very loosely. By the way interconnected layers of neurons fire in a brain as it learns to make sense of new information. The program taught itself through hours of practice, gradually honing an intuitive sense of strategy. That it was then able to beat one of the world's best Go players represents a true milestone in machine intelligence and AI. 
Lawrence Wiener. A rubber ball thrown on the sea. 1970-2014. A few hours after move 37, AlphaGo won the game to go up two games to nothing in the best of five match. Afterwards, Seedal stood before a crowd of journalists and photographers, politely apologizing for letting humankind down. I am quite speechless, he said, blinking through a storm of flash photography. AlphaGo's surprising success points to just how much progress has been made in artificial intelligence over the last few years. After decades of frustration and setbacks often described as an AI winter. Deep learning means that machines can increasingly teach themselves how to perform complex tasks that only a couple of years ago were thought to require the unique intelligence of humans. Self-driving cars are already a foreseeable possibility. In the near future, systems based on deep learning will have oh, diagnosed let's diseases. Touch and on that for treatments. a second. So when I talked about this before. Ah, oh, come on. Bring it back. There we go. So I talked about uh, self-driving cars before. And of course they would be awesome if we could have them. And Elon Musk has pointed out that they are statistically safer than human-driven cars. But um, I don't think it's enough because... I mean, even if statistically they are safer, which is great, um, they still have these weird vulnerabilities like people have been putting large cones on the cars to disable them as they drive through the streets. Uh, and then they can also be um, confused by certain images or patterns in their view. So it's a it's this big field called computer vision. And if you know what you're doing, you can, for example, create street signs that confuse the cars into doing things that you wouldn't otherwise want them to do. I mean, you compare that to humans. Humans still obviously are fallible. You see videos of people driving into buildings or houses all the time. But um, I still think, crazy as it may seem, we do need to hold much higher standards of security, compliance, ethics, all that stuff to autonomous technologies as opposed to human-assisted technologies. Uh, because, I mean... One thing to consider is, if, uh, well, you also have these ethical situations where a car needs to decide who to save, uh, like the classic trolley problem. And if a car were to make a mistake like that where lives are at stake, then it'll be really tough and complicated to hold people accountable. Like, do you... Do you make the software engineer like do you hold them criminally accountable if one of their um, cars crashes into someone for some weird reason uh, it's a tough issue and i don't think there's a clear-cut answer to a lot of thing a lot of these things just yet so i know we're making a lot of strides in self-driving cars and i'm interested to see how that all plays out but I wouldn't even go as far as to say that I have answers to these things. I'll go ahead and uh, leave myself out of that uh, that decision making because I'm not an expert. But it has been cool to follow. Interesting for sure. In the near future, systems based on deep learning will help diagnose diseases and recommend treatments. Deep learning means that Ooh, I only need a little bit more to get that backpack. I gotta find something else to sell. Ago ...were thought to require the unique intelligence of humans. Yet despite these impressive advances, one fundamental capability remains elusive, language. Systems like Siri and IBM's Watson can follow simple spoken or typed commands and answer basic questions, but they can't hold a conversation and have no real understanding of the words they use. If AI is to be truly transformative, this must change. Even though AlphaGo cannot speak, it contains technology that might lead to greater language understanding. At companies such as Google, Facebook, and Amazon, as well as at leading academic AI labs, researchers are attempting to finally solve that seemingly intractable problem. 
using some okay, of the same on. AI tools, including deep learning, that are responsible for AlphaGo's success and today's AI revival. Whether they succeed will determine the scale and character of what is turning into an artificial intelligence revolution. It will help determine whether we have machines we can easily communicate with, machines that become an intimate part of our everyday life, or whether AI systems remain mysterious black boxes. Even as they become more autonomous. There's no way you can have an AI system that's human-like that doesn't have go. language at the heart of it. Give me that says backpack. Josh Tenenbaum, a professor of cognitive science yeah. and computation at MIT. It's one of the most obvious things that set human intelligence apart. Perhaps the same techniques that let AlphaGo Six conquer days. Go will finally enable left. computers to master language, or perhaps something else will also be required. But without language understanding, oh, the impact of AI will be different. Of course, we can still have immensely powerful and intelligent software like AlphaGo. But our relationship with AI may be far less collaborative and perhaps far less friendly. A nagging question since the beginning was, what if you had things that were intelligent in the sense of being effective? But not like us in the sense of not empathizing with what we are, says Terry Winograd, a professor emeritus at Stanford University. You can imagine machines that are not based on human intelligence, which are based on this big data stuff, and which run the world. Machine Whisperers A couple of months after AlphaGo's triumph, I traveled to Silicon Valley, the heart of the latest boom in artificial intelligence. I wanted to visit the researchers who are making remarkable progress on practical applications of AI and who are now trying to give machines greater understanding of language. I started with Winograd, who lives in a suburb nestled into the southern edge of right, time for the mines. in Palo Alto, not far from the headquarters of Google, Facebook, and Apple. With curly white hair and a bushy mustache, he looks the part of a venerable academic, and he has an infectious enthusiasm. Back in 1968, Winograd made one of the earliest efforts to teach a machine to talk intelligently. A math prodigy fascinated with language. You know what? I think Haley. I think Haley might be a good candidate. Let's see. I hope she does. I hope she likes this. Text prompt. She's ignoring me. Language. Does she like this? It didn't seem an outlandish ambition at the time. There we go. Incredible strides were being made in AI, and others at MIT were building complex computer vision systems and futuristic robot arms. There was a sense of unknown, unbounded possibilities, he recalls. Joseph Kosuth. Four Colors, Four Words. 1966. Not everyone was convinced that language could be so easily mastered, though. Some critics, including the influential linguist and MIT professor Noam Chomsky, felt that the AI researchers would struggle to get machines to understand. Given that the mechanics of language in humans were so poorly understood, Winograd remembers attending a party where a student of Chomsky's walked away when he heard him say that he worked in the AI lab. But there was reason to be optimistic, too. Joseph Weizenbaum, a German-born professor at MIT, had built the very first chatbot program a couple of years earlier. Called Eliza, it was programmed to act like a cartoon psychotherapist, repeating key parts of a statement or asking questions to encourage further conversation. If you told the program you were angry at your mother, for instance, it would say, what else comes to mind when you think about your mother? A cheap trick, but it worked surprisingly well. Weizenbaum was shocked when some subjects began confessing their darkest secrets to his machine. There's an obvious problem with applying deep learning to language. It's that words are arbitrary symbols, and as such they are fundamentally different from imagery. Winograd wanted to okay, create gotta stay focused really on copper. Language. But bug meat is actually pretty good too. The scope of the you can make bait out of that. He created a simple virtual environment of a block world consisting of a handful of imaginary objects sitting on an imaginary table. Then he created a program which he named SHRDLU that was capable of parsing all the nouns, verbs, and simple rules of grammar needed to refer to this stripped down virtual world. SHRDLU could describe the objects, answer questions about their relationships, Ugh. and make changes to the block world in response to typed commands. It even had a kind of memory, so that if you told it to move with a red cone, and then later referred to the cone, it would assume you meant the red one rather than one of another color. SHRDLU was held up as a sign that the field of AI was making profound progress. But it was just an illusion. 
When Winograd tried to make the program's block world larger, the rules required to account for the necessary words and grammatical complexity became unmanageable. Just a few years later, he had given up, and eventually he abandoned AI altogether to focus on other areas of research. The limitations were a lot closer than it seemed at the time, he says. Winograd concluded that it would be impossible to give machines true language understanding using the tools available then. The problem, as Hubert Dreyfus, a professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley, argued in a 1972 book called What Computers Can't Do, is that many things humans do require a kind of instinctive intelligence that cannot be captured with hard and fast rules. This is precisely why, before the match between Seedal and AlphaGo, I think that's true to some extent, but probably not to the extent that he was thinking. Pure beauty. Hubert Dreyfus. Gotta look up more on that guy. Dreyfus was making that argument, a few researchers were, in fact, developing an approach that would eventually give machines this kind of intelligence. Taking loose inspiration from neuroscience. They were experimenting with artificial neural networks, layers of mathematically simulated neurons that could be trained to fire. Okay, I gotta try to make it to. To begin with, these systems were painfully slow, and the approach was dismissed as impractical for logic and reasoning. Crucially, though, neural networks could learn to do things that couldn't be hand coded, and later this would prove useful for simple tasks such as recognizing handwritten characters. A skill that was commercialized in the 1990s for reading the numbers on checks. Proponents maintained that neural networks would eventually let machines to do much, <laughs> much more. One day, they claimed it's the worst, that dying in the mines. Understand language. Over it's the my past fault. few years, neural networks have become vastly more complex what did and I lose? powerful. The approach has benefited from key mathematical refinements and, more important, faster computer hardware and oodles of data. Bug me, Earth Chris. Oh, okay, that's, researchers at the University that's of not Toronto too bad. ...had shown that a many-layered deep learning network could recognize speech with record accuracy. All right. And then in 2012, the same group won a machine vision contest using a deep learning algorithm that was astonishingly accurate. A deep learning neural network recognizes objects and images using a simple trick. A layer of simulated neurons receives input in the form of an image, and some of those neurons will fire in response to the intensity of individual pixels. The resulting signal passes through many more layers of interconnected neurons before reaching an output layer, which signals that the object has been seen. A mathematical technique known as backpropagation is used to adjust the sensitivity of the network's neurons to produce the correct response. It is this step that gives the system the ability to learn. Different layers inside the network will respond to features such as edges, colors, or texture. Such systems can now recognize objects, animals, or faces with an accuracy that rivals that of humans. There's an obvious problem with applying deep learning to language. It's that words are arbitrary symbols, and as such they are fundamentally different from imagery. Two words can be similar in meaning while containing completely different letters, for instance, and the same word can mean various things in different contexts. In the 1980s, researchers had come up with a clever idea about how to turn language into the type of problem a neural network can tackle. They showed that words can be represented as mathematical vectors, allowing similarities between related words to be calculated. For example, boat and a water are close enough to do more space, mind work. they look very different. Researchers at the University of Montreal, led by Yoshua Benjo and another group at Google, have used this insight to build networks in which each word in a sentence can be used to construct a more complex representation, something that Jeffrey Hinton, a professor at the University of Toronto and a prominent deep learning researcher who works part-time at Google, Copper calls a thought vector. And stone. By using two enough? such networks, yeah. it's possible to translate between two languages with excellent accuracy. And by combining this type of network with one designed to recognize objects and images, it is possible to conjure up surprisingly plausible captions. The Purpose of Life Sitting in a conference room at the heart of Google's bustling headquarters in Mountain View, California, one of the company's researchers who helped develop this approach, Kwok Lu, is contemplating the idea of a machine that could hold a proper conversation. Lee's ambitions cut right to the heart of why talking machines could be Okay, useful. rant number two. I want a way to simulate thoughts in a machine. Rant number two is um, this 
article came out in August 2016, which up to that point, I mean, there were some there was some conversational AI technology, Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant. I don't know if Cortana was out back then. Um, those are the main ones, but um, conversational AI has been out for a while. But if you've been following it or you use it, you know it hasn't been really the best or all that useful until the release of GPT-3, um, which was like something like November 2022 or 2021. I forgot when it came out. But um, it's been like, has it been less than a year? I think it's been less than a year. Ah, now I gotta check. ChatGPT came out November 30th, 2022. So yes, it has been less than a year. Um, it really was groundbreaking and it, it continues to be the best performing model out there when it comes to conversational AI. I mean, of course it's text-based, but there's also a ton of different things that it's been um, integrated with that help it to go beyond that. Well, anyways... Um, Ooh, get a copper pickaxe? Yeah. Oh, but I need money, so I can't get that yet. All right, so back to ChatGPT. Um, so up to this point, 2016, all the models um, tended to use this specific approach that had uh, like an encoder and a decoder and it used sequences of words in a specific order to try to understand and, and write responses to things. Um, but in 2017, which was like a year after this article came out, um, Google, uh, I, I forgot which department within Google, but a team at Google came out with this article called Attention is All You Need. And they talked about how you don't need an encoder and a decoder you just need the encoder and this attention mechanism. Of course, all this stuff is based on this crazy, you know, calculus and linear algebra and computer science-y stuff. Um, but the article, even though it's pretty dense and difficult for the layperson to understand, it's pretty incredible. I mean, first of all, the name is pretty, pretty cool. Attention is all you need. And they talk about this like machine attention mechanism that they've come up with and how it outperforms all the best models in the game. And that article, Attention is All You Need, was uh, part of the inspiration for the technology behind ChatGPT and all these other ones that have come out since, like Llama um, and all the others. So it's a really interesting topic. And... It's interesting looking back uh, before ChatGPT came out to see how people thought about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and what what machines are capable of. Because, I mean, now, if for anyone who has had some time with GPT, in particular GPT-4, and you know how to use it and what its real benefits and possibilities are i mean the sky's the limit and it's a crazy time we're living in it really is like <laughs> it's like the um the master brain of the computers in the matrix or if you ever watch the anime psychopaths it's like that okay no spoilers but it's it's like that it's like psychopaths um and we're living through it it's here it's not some point in the distant future, and it is stranger than fiction. It's, I think, crazier than a lot of the sci-fi that people have thought up, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, it could go in one of so many different ways, and there's infinite possibilities, 
but it's on us to make sure that we steer all this stuff in the right direction. All right, and rant back to the uh, back to the reading. I want a way to simulate thoughts in a machine, he says. And if you want to simulate thoughts, then you should be able to ask a machine what it's thinking about. Tauba Auerbach. The answer wasn't here too. 2008. Google is already teaching its computers the basics of language. This May the company announced a system, dubbed Parsi McParseface, that can look at syntax, recognizing nouns, verbs, and other elements of text. It isn't hard to see how valuable better language understanding could be to the company. Google's search algorithm used to simply track keywords and links between web pages. Now, using a system called RankBrain, it reads the text on pages in an effort to glean meaning and deliver better results. Lu wants to take that much further. Adapting the system that's proved useful in translation and image captioning, he and his colleagues built Smart Reply which reads the contents of Gmail messages and suggests a handful of possible replies. He also created a program that learned from Google's IT support chat logs how to answer simple technical queries. Most recently, Le built a program capable of producing All right, possible responses pause for me. to open I'll leave it questions. Going. It was trained by being fed dialogue from 18,900 movies. Some of its replies seem eerily spot on. For example, Lu asked, what is the purpose of life? And the program responded, to serve the greater good. It was a pretty good answer, he remembers with a big grin. Probably better than mine would have been. There's only one problem, as quickly becomes apparent when you look at more of the system's answers. When Lo asked, how many legs does a cat have? His system answered, four, I think. Then he tried, how many legs does a centipede have? Which produced a curious response. Eight. Basically, Lee's program has no idea what it's talking about. It understands that certain combinations of symbols go together, but it has no appreciation of the real world. It doesn't know what a centipede actually looks like, or how it moves. It is still just an illusion of intelligence, without the kind of common sense that humans take for granted. Deep learning systems can often be wonky this way. The one Google created to generate captions for images would make bizarre errors, like describing a street sign as a refrigerator filled with food. Lu asked, what is the purpose of life, and the program responded, to serve the greater good. By a curious coincidence, Terry Winograd's next-door neighbor in Palo Alto is someone who might be able to help computers attain a deeper appreciation of what words actually mean. Faith Bay Lee, director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, was on maternity leave when I visited, but she invited me to her home and proudly introduced me to her beautiful three-month-old baby. Phoenix. See how she looks at you more than me, Lee said as Phoenix stared at me. That's because you are new, it's early facial recognition. Lee has spent much of her career researching machine learning and computer vision. Several years ago, she led an effort to build a database of millions of images of objects, each tagged with an appropriate keyword. But Lee believes machines need an even more sophisticated understanding of what's happening in the world, and this year her team released another database of images, annotated in much richer detail. Each image has been tagged by a human with dozens of descriptors, a dog riding a skateboard, dog has fluffy, wavy fur, road is cracked, and so on. The hope is that machine learning systems will learn to understand more about the physical world. The language part of the brain gets fed a lot of information, including from the visual system, Lee says. An important part of AI will be integrating these systems. This is closer to the way children learn, by associating words with objects, relationships, and actions. But the analogy with human learning goes only so far. Young children do not need to see a skateboarding dog to be able to imagine or verbally describe one. Indeed, Lee believes that today's machine learning and AI tools won't be enough to bring about real AI. It's not just going to be data-rich deep learning, she says. Lee believes AI researchers will need to think about things like emotional and social intelligence. We are terrible at computing with huge data, she says, but we're great at abstraction and creativity. No one knows how to give machines those human skills, if it is even possible. Is there something uniquely human about such qualities that puts them beyond the reach of AI? 
Cognitive scientists like MIT's Tenenbaum theorize that important components of the mind are missing from today's neural networks, no matter how large those networks might be. Humans have the ability to learn very quickly from a relatively small amount of data and have a built-in ability to model the world in 3D very efficiently. Language builds on other abilities that are probably more basic, that are present in young infants before they have language. Perceiving the world visually, acting on our motor systems, understanding the physics of the world or other agents' goals, Tenenbaum says. If he is right, then it will be difficult to recreate language understanding in machines and AI systems without trying to mimic human learning, mental model building, and psychology. Explain yourself. Noah Goodman's office in Stanford's psychology department is practically bare except for a couple of abstract paintings propped against one wall and a few overgrown plants. When I arrived, Goodman was typing away on a laptop, his bare feet up on a table. All right, I'm back. We took a stroll across the sun bleached campus. I was listening the whole coffee. time. Language is special in that it relies on a lot of knowledge about language, but it also relies on a huge amount of common sense knowledge about the world. It's already 12. And those two go together in very subtle ways, he explained. Goodman and his students have developed a programming language called Weppel that can be used to give computers a kind of probabilistic common sense which turns out to be pretty useful in a conversation. One experimental version can understand puns, and another can cope with hyperbole. If it is told that some people had to wait a forever for a table in a restaurant, it will automatically decide that the literal meaning is improbable. And they most likely just hung around for a long time and were annoyed. The system is far from truly intelligent, but it shows how new approaches could help make AI programs that talk in a more lifelike way. At the same time, Goodman's example also suggests just how difficult it will be to teach Mines. language to machines. Mines. I need that copper. Understanding the contextual meaning of a forever is the kind of thing that AI systems will need to learn, but it is a rather simple and rudimentary accomplishment. I want a way to simulate Ooh, thoughts. Did I save? Machine, he says. Yeah. Okay. And if you want to simulate thoughts, then you should be able to ask a machine what hey, it's Haley. thinking about. Still, despite the difficulty and complexity of the problem. Talk to her again. The startling success that researchers have had using deep learning techniques to recognize images and excel at games like Go does at least provide hope that we might be on the verge of breakthroughs in language, too. If so, those advances will come just in time. How's that going? Yeah. If AI is to serve as a ubiquitous tool that people use to augment their own intelligence and trust to take over tasks in a seamless collaboration, language will be key. That will be especially true as AI systems increasingly use deep learning and other techniques Maru, to assess the Maru, she doesn't like flowers, things. but whatever, she's In gonna general, take it. deep learning systems are awe-inspiring. Talk to me. John Leonard, a professor at MIT who researches on yeah, driving. Yeah, I do. Driving. But on the other hand, uh, their performance <laughs> is really See, she's understand. rude. Toyota, which is studying a range of self-driving technologies, has initiated a research Do you enjoy working on the farm? Because Jared otherwise, I don't know why you do it. intelligence and programming language. To develop automated driving systems capable of explaining why they took a particular action. And an obvious way for a self-driving car to do this would be by talking. Building systems that know what they know is a really hard problem, says Leonard, who is leading a different Toyota-backed project at MIT. But, yeah, ideally they would give not just an answer, but an explanation. A few weeks after returning from California, I saw David Silver, the Google DeepMind researcher who designed AlphaGo, give a talk about the match against Seedal at an academic conference in New York. Silver explained that when the program came up with its killer move during Game 2, his team was just as surprised as everyone else. All they could see was AlphaGo's predicted odds of winning, which changed little even after move 37. It was only several days later, after careful analysis, that the Google team made a discovery. By digesting previous games, the program had calculated the chances of a human player making the same move at 1 in 10,000. And its practice games had also shown that the play offered an unusually strong positional advantage. So in a way, the machine knew that Seedal would be completely blindsided. Silver said that Google is considering several options for commercializing the technology, including some sort of intelligent assistant and a tool for healthcare. Afterward, I asked him about the importance of being able to communicate with the AI behind such systems. That's an interesting question, he said after a pause. 
For some applications it may be important. Like in healthcare, it may be important to know why a decision is being made. Indeed, as AI systems become increasingly sophisticated and complex, it is hard to envision how we will collaborate with them without language, without being able to ask them, why? More than this. The ability to communicate effortlessly with computers would make them infinitely more useful, and it would feel nothing short of magical. After all, language is our most powerful way of making sense of the world and interacting with it. It's about time that our machines caught up. Will Knight is senior editor for AI and robotics at MIT Technology Review. His feature, The People's Robots, appeared in the May-June issue. Great article. Uh, nonetheless, very thought-provoking. A little dated at this point. Uh, I would love to see Will Knight uh, revisit this. But definitely still important for the foundations. Oh, shoot. When uh, the color changes like this, it means you're about to get mobbed by enemies. Yep. And I'm not good at fighting in this game. Uh... Oh my god, stop. Stop. Oh my god. Okay, good. Can I make it to floor 15? Okay, well, let me get to the next article. Next article is The Rise and Fall of the English Sentence by Julie Sedivi. And we're going to do UK? Let's do Australia. Australia, I think Annette. Yeah. All right, let's go. The rise and fall of the English sentence. The surprising forces <laughs> oh, influencing the complexity good one. of the language we speak. Yes, in I need to switch the uh by Julie Sedevi. Stream info. The course of human events. I did. It becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political band Come which on. Has connected them with another and to I need to change to Stardew. This the is not TDRA 20. To which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A People are strict about that. that they, they point it out immediately. Which impel them to the separation. But understandable. Declaration of Independence. Opening sentence. An iconic sentence, this. But how did it ever okay, make its way into the world? Okay, there we go. Stream info updated. At 71 words. It is composed of eight separate clauses, each anchored by its own verb, nested within one another in various arrangements. Thank you, Scott. Clause, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires, hangs suspended above a 50-word subordinate clause that must first be unfurled. Like an intricate equation, the sentence exudes a mathematical sophistication, turning its face toward infinitude. To some linguists, come on, die. Among them, sentences like these illustrate an essential yeah. property of human language. Cut some shoes. These scientists have argued that recursion. A technique that allows chunks of language such as sentences to be embedded inside each other, with no hard limit on the number of nestings, is a universal human ability. Perhaps even the one uniquely human ability that supports language. It's what allows us to create, literally, an infinite oh, it's variety not, of novel sentences. They're not even as good as the boots words. I'm wearing. But that leads to a curious puzzle. Complex sentences are not ubiquitous among the world's languages. Many languages have little use for them. They prefer to string together simple clauses. They may okay. even lack like certain words such as relative pronouns that and which or connectors like if, despite, and although, these words make it possible to link clauses together into larger sentences. Allegedly, the Piraha language along the Macy River of Brazil lacks recursion altogether. According to linguist Dan Everett, Piraha speakers avoid linguistic nesting of all kinds, oh. even in structures such as John's brother's house. Instead, they would say something like, brother's house. John has a brother. It is the same one. 
This can't be pinned on biological evolution. All evidence suggests that humans around the world are born with more or less the same brains. Abundant childhood exposure to a language with lead sentences practically guarantees their mastery. Even adult Piraha speakers, who have remained unusually isolated from European languages... Ah, I need to make it to 415. Stop. Provided that they spend enough time interacting with speakers of Brazilian Portuguese. I can't die again. Don't do it. Adequate diet of embedded structures. Sentences Thank you. like the opening line of the Declaration of Independence simply do not occur in conversation. Yes. More okay. useful Home. Than the notion of linguistic evolution. It's the languages themselves, rather than the brains, that have evolved along different paths. <laughs> And just as different species are shaped by adaptations to specific ecological niches, certain linguistic features, like sentence complexity, survive and thrive. It's funny on seeing how Gutex and Alex Jabali have been immortalized via Twitch features. emotes. Languages with very simple sentence structure are, for the most part, oral languages. It's the languages that have a culture of writing, developed over a long span of time that display a fondness for stacking clauses onto one another to create towering sentences. This pattern raises the possibility that the invention of writing, a very recent innovation tagged onto the very last millennia of human evolution, can dramatically alter a language's linguistic niche, spurring the development of elaborate sentence structure and leading to the shedding of other features. On a time scale, I can't sell those achieved through biological evolution. Okay, they're trash then. That's so. Then the languages that many of us have grown up with are very different from the languages that have been spoken throughout the vast majority of human existence. Many of the world's oral languages are quite unlike European languages. Their sentences contain few words. They rarely combine more than one clause. Linguist Marianne Mithen has noted some striking differences. In English, 34% of clauses in conversational American English are embedded clauses. In Mohawk, spoken in Quebec Dash, only 7% are. Gunwingu, an Australian language, has 6% in Kathlamet, formerly spoken in Washington State, has only 2% an English speaker might say, would you teach me to make bread? But a Mohawk speaker would break this down into several short sentences, saying something like this, it will be possible? You will teach me. I will make bread. In English, you might say, he came near boys who were throwing spears at something. A Kathlamet approximation would go like this. He came near those boys. They were throwing spears at something then. Some oral languages do regularly embed clauses, suggesting that writing is not necessary for complex syntax. But, as can be seen in a number of indigenous languages, longer and more complicated sentences often emerge as a result of contact with a written language. Structurally useful words, if, and then, because, but, have spread from Spanish to various Mexican languages such as Nahuatl, Sierra Popoluca, and Otomi. With the latter borrowing heavily from Spanish, in one sample, almost 80% of Otomi subordinate clauses began with borrowed connector words. Only four such words are native to Otomi. In contrast, I was talking Spanish away on mute. Okay, my dog started barking. I needed to help her. She's cuckoo bananas right now. Stop. Relationships between clauses, Relax. But not Re the exact words. Relax. This can be seen in various Iroquoian languages. Look, right, have a right word here. For, and that right doesn't here. derive from a common linguistic ancestor. Okay, but stop barking. But instead reflects recent adaptions of each language's no, own linguistic no. resources to express the notion of a ness. We utter the first syllables of a sentence while taking a leap of faith that we'll be able to choose the right words en route. The development of intricate sentences in modern European languages has unfolded slowly. These languages now churn out relative clauses with boundless enthusiasm but their common ancestor, Proto-Indo-European, may have lacked the necessary grammatical tools to produce them at all. According to linguist Guy Deutscher, the earliest clay tablets, about 2500 BC, of the ancient language Akkadian reveal few embedded clauses. The same is evidently true of the earliest stages of other ancient written languages such as Sumerian, Hittite, or Greek. Although these languages boasted a profusion of grammatical features suitable for expressing subtle nuances of meaning, and included a variety of fancy word-building techniques, they avoided complicated sentence recursion. When they did combine clauses into larger structures, this technique looked less like Russian dolls, with one clause inside another, and more like beads on a necklace. 
with one clause added next to another, and resembled this sentence from an old Hittite text, 14th century BC- I drove in a chariot to Kunu, and a thunderstorm came, then the storm god kept thundering terribly, and I feared, and the speech in my mouth became small, and the speech came up a little bit. And I forgot this matter completely, but afterwards the years came and went, and this matter came to appear repeatedly in my dreams, and God's hand seized me in my dreams, and then my mouth went sideways, and the invention of writing sparked certain innovations such that by 1800 BC, Akkadian texts already exhibited complex sentences that rival the prose of Henry James in their complexity. One such sentence, from Hammurabi's Code of Law, proceeds like this. Ooh. The shepherd releases the sheep and goats into a field. The shepherd shall guard the field. Nice. The divergence between spoken These and written language are can awesome. be witnessed around the world, at all time scales. Compare, for example, the number of Finnish subordinate clauses in the old oral tradition to modern written I'm Finnish. I'm just going to go collect them. There are embedded clauses in the Kalevala, a collection of folk poetry that constitutes the Finnish national epic dash. But there are not very many. A 1,300 word sample yields three fairly simple examples, but a 1,300 word stretch of current written Finnish would typically contain about 60, and these would be more varied and more complex. A more recent example, the Somali language had essentially no written tradition until 1972, when it became the official state language. Over a mere 20 year period, researchers have observed noticeable changes to the written language, such as the emergence of longer and more complex words and greater elaboration of sentence structure. Modern languages with a long literary tradition show a stark split between their written and spoken styles across many contexts. In current English, writing uses more varied vocabulary than conversational speech, and it uses rarer and longer words much more often. Certain structures, such as passive sentences, prepositional phrases, and relative clauses, appear more often in written than spoken language. Writers generally elaborate their ideas more explicitly through syntax whereas speakers leave more material implicit. And written language stacks clauses inside each other to a greater depth than spoken language. This is one of the most striking differences between speech and text. Sentences like the opening line of the Declaration of Independence simply do not occur in conversation. Okay, next rant. Why and how did syntax explode? Alright, next rant is... Okay, I'm going to read the <laughs> opening sentence of the Declaration of Independence for context. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. It's too much. It's too much. I'm, I mean, okay, listen. For formal writing, formal communication, it still sucks. I still don't like it. Um, I think that the point of language and communication is to be understood. And if you're creating these, like equations or expressions that need to be solved mathematically and you have to have like this prior training it's just making it more exclusive less inclusive less accessible and it totally goes against in my opinion the original purpose of language which is to be understood by the greatest amount of people so um this article is talking about recursion and there's definitely some good applications of recursion and it's good to practice reading and using recursive sentences so you can improve your skills but ultimately we want to come up with a language a, com a medium of communication where we can be understood by the greatest amount of people. Um, that's my opinion. And anything that doesn't do that is um, just being uh, pedantic. It's just being sophisticated and intellectual for its own sake. Um, 
just to try to, I don't know, create some sort of following or community of other like-minded intellectuals, which, I mean, it has its own uses, but uh, for most use cases, let's, let's just include everyone. Include everyone in the conversation, in the dialogue. That's my opinion. Okay, back to it. Why and how did syntax explode like this? For one thing, writing creates an entirely different communicative environment from spoken interactions, with text intensifying certain pressures and relaxing others. When writing is first introduced into a society, it is typically used mainly as a record of spoken language, but as writers eventually write for readers, not hearers. The language of text diverges from speech. Some existing features come to be used more generously than in spoken language, and new grammatical tools may be introduced. Speech also proceeds under the whips of two tyrants. Can I get there before five? Memory. Our memories aren't nearly capacious enough to allow us to compose and pre-compile each sentence before beginning to utter its first syllable. Instead, speaking is like driving with a general sense of the destination. But no clear route planned, we utter the first syllables of a sentence while taking a leap of faith that we'll be able to choose the right words on route and formulate phrases adequately as the words tumble out of our mouths and bring us to an intersection in our thoughts that demands our next move. This puts be open, up come on, be open. But written text, Robin. which can be more deliberately planned out and revised, is able to transcend this. Readers too, and not just writers, are sprung from the shackles of time and memory. If reading were like hearing language, we would view text through a two-character aperture moving inexorably forward, unable to slow down, pause, or dart back and reread. What do you got for me? But eye-tracking studies show that when we read, we break free of linear time and seize control over the flow of information. Mm -hmm. Our eye movements lurching along at inconsistent speeds Nothing and right frequently now. jumping back okay. to early uh, parts of a sentence which, mine. during speech, Time for the mine. Be auditory vapor. Need more copper, Such and I need a better weapon. Such the most glorious excesses of recursion in text. The complex syntax fostered by writing seems to be an acquired skill much like mental arithmetic. More or less everyone... Oh, I don't have my weapon with me. It. Shoot. But to be able to calculate truly spectacular equations in your head, you need heavy practice. Just as to understand and compose elaborate sentences with ease, you need plenty of experience with such sentences. Reading transforms the experimental landscape, offering a range and complexity of sentence structure that is rarely found in speech. Three to seven. When children are okay, a linguistic diet that is rich in complex sentences, these become easier to compute, and in turn, more readily produced under the time pressures imposed by speech. For example, psychologist Jessica Montag and her colleagues targeted relative clauses in the passive voice, the dog that was hit by the car dash which are exceedingly rare in speech but more abundant in text, even that written for children. They found that heavy readers in the 8 to 12 year old range produced such structures more often than children who read less. Even among adults, the production of these sentences was highly correlated with how much text they consumed, suggesting that avid readers are far more likely to transmit complex sentences to future generations. The unpredictable aspects of language, the things you just have to know, may be especially slippery for the adult mind. All of this suggests that exposure to literary language is essential for the health of complex recursive sentences in English. If certain structures are too rare in speech to be reliably mastered by learners and passed on, then they may fade out within a community of non-readers. Naturally, this raises the question. Could syntactic complexity in literate languages diminish over time, if new technologies, podcasts, video lectures, and audiobooks to the language more tight I hope so its inherent limitations. because some of this in fact highly academic work like those found in the is no good for our modern age been in or at English, the very least we need to well work on German, like oh no time. according Shoot. to texts analyzed by I'm about to get owned Lennon, the average sentence length in written English has shrunk since the 17th century from between 40 to 70 words to a more modest 20 with a significant paring down of the number of subordinate and relative clauses Passive sentences, explicit connectors. I don't like clauses, exclusive scholarship. 
These changes may reflect shifts in readers' experience with If language. your writing style is exclusive well, or requires some sort of training to understand, lives of scholarly study, now it's a universal basis. I mean, I guess more people now read because they I'm have generalizing to, too much, I guess. Still consume the but bulk of their linguistic I just feel like may have little we need to do away with the end. being intellectual for Weeks its own sake. The need to make text accessible to exactly a snobbery with a wide range of linguistic experiences has created some pressure to bring the structures of written English more in line with spoken English. Yes. Still, the English language represents not a single ecosystem, but many. One moment. A bird's eye view of the overall trajectory of English would miss some of the most dramatic changes occurring within its particular linguistic niches. That brings to the for another key reason why language might gravitate towards streamlined syntax, the nature of the communities that use it. Oral languages may avoid pushing the limits of syntax not just because they are bound to speech, but also because they have other ways to express complex meanings. Linguists take great pains to point out that languages with simple sentences erupt with complexity elsewhere. They typically pack many particles of meaning into a single word. For example, the Mohawk word Sahanwanhotongkwas conveys as much meaning as the English sentence, she opened the door for him again. In English, you need two clauses, one embedded inside the other, to say, he says she's leaving, but in Yipik, a language spoken in Alaska, you can use a single word, a yagnia, a yagniak, in contrast. Means he says okay, the word is leaving. that I gotta jump I off because we're gonna go do simply, stuff. So... I gotta shut this the down. I'm gonna such complex words can be go to sleep making them seem in the game, <laughs> and then I gotta go do real life stuff. So I'm gonna cut it off pretty abruptly here. The Siberian tongue ket, a language in which verbs take pronoun prefixes to mark who is performing an action. There are two different sets of prefixes that attach to different verbs, and you simply have to know which verb takes which set. Moreover. Many verbs simultaneously take two pronoun prefixes that mean the same thing, but many don't. You just have to know dash, which trigger subtle shifts in meaning. For instance, okay, good day, good stream. Means, I go to the river and come back a bit later. But digdadak, which involves the double use of the same pronoun prefix, and uh, means I might I log in later. Not sure, season. but thank you for tuning in, and we'll see pronoun, you next time. Maybe later tonight. I go to the. <laughs> All right, take care. Stay some days or weeks.